Hey there, chemistry kids. This is the podcast 3.4. We're going to talk about where are the electrons in the atom. Um, so this is all about locating electrons, and there's three different ways we use to tell where the electrons are. Bohr models, Aufbau diagrams, and electron configurations. So let's get started on this. If we're going to locate electrons in atoms, then it's important to understand that the electrons form a shell around the nucleus. If the nucleus were the size of a tennis ball, say, in a great big stadium the size of Invesco Field, which is now, what, Sports Authority Field or whatever, then um, if we put this on the 50-yard line, the nucleus, then trying to get in the door to the Sports Authority Field, you would encounter this barrier built by the electrons, not because they're solid, but because they are out here flying around so fast with such a high speed around the nucleus that they seem like a solid wall. And they take up so much space zipping around here that if our nucleus was the size of a tennis ball, then the atom would occupy the space of the entire stadium. But you wouldn't even be able to get in the doors because it would seem like you encounter this barrier that keeps you out then electrons form this shell around the nucleus of the atom. So the electrons are the things that other atoms encounter first, and they determine how the chemical reacts with other things. The most stable configuration for electrons is to have an octet. That means we want to have eight electrons in our outside um, energy level. So it's important that we can describe where the electrons are because this allows us to predict how an element is going to interact with other elements. You see, the electrons are orbiting the nucleus in specific energy levels. The Bohr diagram describes these as rings or orbits or um, shells. So sometimes it's called the planetary model because it describes the electrons sort of orbiting around the nucleus in a series of rings or shells. Each ring would be described by a specific amount of energy. And to simplify your life, the first ring is called energy level one, and the second is energy level two, and the third is energy level three, and so on. That doesn't seem too hard, right? And then we simply use the periodic table of elements to sketch the location of the electrons in each energy level. So no matter how many electrons an atom has, we can describe where they are. So here's an example. Let's look at um, this particular nucleus. So if these are all representing positive charges in the nucleus of the atom, then these would each be called protons. Let's count the number of protons in this nucleus, and it looks like I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so eight protons, eight positive charges means I must necessarily have eight electrons for this atom to balance. So look on your periodic table and tell me what is the name of this atom. It's got to be got to be oxygen, right? How come I can't get there it is, oxygen. Oh, because here's number eight. Eight protons means this bad boy is oxygen. All right, let's go back to our screen. The other kind of back, there we go, that kind of back. So here's what we're gonna do with the periodic table for your Bohr diagram. We know we need to locate eight electrons. First row of the periodic table shows you how many electrons belong in the first ring. Notice there's one space here and one space here for a total of two boxes on the first row. That means for your electron, you get to only have two electrons. So I'm going to draw them as a negative particle on the first ring here. And I put them on opposite sides because they're both negatively charged. We want to keep the like charges as far apart as possible. Okay, so what's next? We've got to fill in the second ring. Well, the second row of the periodic ta table tells you exactly how many electrons we can put in there. Let's count from left to right. One, two, three, four, five, six. So to get all the way across to where oxygen is, there's six steps in the second row. What that means for our atom is that we need six electrons in the second ring. That's why it takes six steps to get there. 
So I'm going to hit north, then south, then east, and west, and then I'm going to start pairing electrons up because I need two more to make this complete, right? So I have six total electrons in my second ring for a grand total of two in the first, six in the second, eight electrons to balance the eight protons that are in the nucleus. That's how we do a Bohr diagram. We use a ring to indicate what energy level it is, and then we count across from left to right on the periodic table. The row that the element is in on the periodic table is the thing that tells you how many rings to draw. So if we were drawing rubidium, then that means I'm going to need to have five, um, five rings to hold all of those electrons because it's in the fifth row. And then we count across from left to right to know how many electrons go in each energy level. All right, well, let's look at a shortcut method because when we get to larger atoms like rubidium that had five rings, it can get a little bit messy. Let me clear the writing. Here we go. First of all, your circles can be drawn as arcs. So instead of drawing a circle all the way around, you're going to draw an arc like this to represent the ring. And instead of drawing each little positive charge for the proton and for the neutron, we're just going to put a number here. Um, if we were doing, say, calcium, we would want to put 20 protons in the nucleus. Instead of drawing 20 little tiny circles with pluses in them, which would be a big drag, trust me, we just put 20 P plus and then, I don't know, 20 N zero, depending on its atomic. Um, how about aluminum? Let's do aluminum, like I said. Clear out some of my writing. Okay, aluminum's right here, number 13, right? So that means I have 13 protons in my nucleus. 13 protons, and now I need to see the periodic table again. 26.98 rounds to 27. Do you remember how to represent uh, the neutrons? Remember we take our atomic mass and round it to the nearest whole number, then subtract the protons to find the number of neutrons. So I have 14 neutrons in the nucleus of aluminum. Okay, now let's locate the electrons. So we're going to go from top to bottom and left to right until we land on aluminum. So in the first row of the periodic table, what do we have? Two electrons in the first row. That means in the first ring, sorry about all this clickety-click, I get to have two electrons in the first ring. So I'm going to put just the number two on my first arc. Got it? The arc represents the ring because we don't want to have to draw it all the way around. Now let's do the second ring. Get my periodic table back. How many steps is it going to take here? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so eight steps. You probably already knew that, right? Because a full shell is represented by eight electrons. So our second ring has to be full before we can go on to our third ring. So we better have eight electrons on our second arc. All right, so I write the number eight. We don't have to draw eight little circles with minus signs in them. Now is the time when we get to the row where aluminum is. So on our periodic table, we're going to count across from left to right until we land on aluminum now. One, two, three steps. So my third ring gets to have three electrons. Let me get my arcs back. Here we are. And so all I write on my third ring is the number three. That's it. So you can use this shortcut for any atom, um, but it's especially helpful when we have really large atoms. Why would I tell you to do it if it's wrong? Well, here's the trouble. The Bohr model does a great job of describing energy transitions for electrons. So it still is very useful for us in understanding how electrons work. But the trouble is that electrons don't move in concentric circles. They don't stay on their little path like a planet does. In fact, they're free to move 
anywhere within the boundaries of that circle. And it's not even a two-dimensional circle. It's a sphere. It's a three-dimensional space. So rather than going around in a circle, they can actually go anywhere inside a sphere, a three-dimensional shape. Schrodinger made equations that describe the probability of finding an electron in any given location. And so here's a graph that, that is described and defined by the equations that Schrodinger wrote to tell us where the electrons can be found. So at some energy levels, they would be contained within a space that looks like a sphere and never found outside of that space. And in other energy levels, they would be found in shapes that look more like sort of petals on a flower or, or dumbbells. And then in other areas, they would be defined by this type of probability when you get to higher energy levels. This is what transition metals do with their electrons. And that allows them to, um, to sort of stash the electrons hidden away from other elements so they cannot get to them. They tuck them down deep inside so that nobody can get to them. So we call these shapes S, P, D, and F. The electrons are truly mapped out on the periodic table. So you want to get your periodic table from your handout in your packet and find where the periodic table is printed there for you. If you don't have one, your teacher's going to give you one in class for you to locate um, the S, P, D, and F. Each section represents a different orbital shape. So let's look at these sections individually. First of all, you'll notice the two really tall columns, the periodic table is shaped kind of like a, a wonky castle where one side is bigger than the other. It looks like they forgot to finish it, right? Well, here on the left side, where these first two rows are, these are the ones that fill in S-shaped orbitals. And the S is for the sphere. S-shaped orbitals have a spherical shape. And you'll notice that as you get to higher energy levels, energy level 1 has one sphere, level 2 has two spheres, level 3 has three spheres, and so on. So the higher you get, the more spheres there are, concentric spheres. So really, Bohr wasn't that far off, was he? Well, not, not really, terribly, but then here comes more. Because over here on the right, in this other columns that form turrets of our castle, then we've got these P-shaped orbitals. And the P-shaped orbitals orient themselves along the X, Y, and Z axes. So if you could imagine with me your X and Y axis where you've got a pedal this way and a pedal this way, and you have one up and one down, so that's easy to see. Here's your um, up and down, right? And then here's your side to side. But now let's imagine another axis for a three-dimensional shape, one that comes out of the plane of the screen and back into the plane of the screen. That's these ones, where it's the same shape, we're just twisting it around now so that it's oriented like coming towards you and going away from you. That's what the P orbitals look like. It's sort of like a balloon that somebody's pinched the middle and squished it so tightly that now they're not even touching anymore. So that's what a P-shaped orbital looks like. And because each of these little spaces can hold two electrons, and there's three spaces, then we have six electrons total that can fit one that spins up and one that spins down, and then one that's up and one that's down, and then over here, one up and one down. So that's six electrons total that fit in these three different shapes of P-orbitals. I neglected to mention in your spherical orbitals, we can hold a maximum of two electrons um, total because once there's more than that, they get too crowded and repel one another. So as you go across the row in row two, we have both the S shape and the P shape orbitals. So what happens is that we get a maximum of two plus six or eight total electrons to make it complete where now it cannot hold any more, and we got to go to the next energy level. So what's next? After the P-shaped orbitals, we get to the crazy kinds of orbitals. These transition elements are able to store electrons away 
in places that other elements won't have access to them in a chemical reaction. You see how many different places there are to hide the two electrons? One's going to spin up and one's going to spin down. And so now suddenly the electrons are not nearly as close as they would have been if we had only two lobes or in the S shape only one sphere in which to hide our electrons. And since these are more crowded than the D-shaped orbitals, they're a higher energy level. In the D orbitals, we're going to take our energy level and take one away from that because they spread the electrons out so much more that they get to drop their energy. It's hard to crowd two negatives together. It's like pushing the two wrong ends of a magnet together. Can you imagine trying to do that for six different electrons? Well, since d orbitals are in so many different places and we have different pockets, so to speak, in which to hide our electrons, then we can keep them farther apart and their energy level drops an entire level. So where we're in the fourth row for your periodic table, the D section is going to be called 3D because it's an entire energy level less than the S and the P. All right, well, you thought Ds looked kind of weird. Wait till you see the lanthanide series and the actinide series. They're down here along the bottom of the periodic table, sort of floating down there at the bottom. Really, if you look at the numbers, that's not where they truly belong. See, here's number 56. And then here's number 57. So they belong up in here. And in my class, we're going to cut apart a periodic table and put them back where they belong so that you can see how they fit into the rest. But they also have similarities in that everybody in this row and in this row, the lanthanide series and the actinide series, they're going to stash their electrons away even deeper than the transition metals. So the energy level is going to drop again even less than the d orbitals. So we take our energy level described by the row and subtract two away. So this energy level is going to be called level four. The shape is called F, the F orbitals. And I think F must stand for funky because look at how crazy these orbitals are. They're in so many different places in different shapes. So the F orbitals can hide electrons farther apart than any other type their energy level drops way down. There is such a thing as G orbitals and H orbitals, and you can look them up on Google. We theorize, um, the scientists do, that electrons can go into those orbitals if they're given enough energy, but also that ultimately some atom is going to be described um, that has electrons naturally stored there. We just haven't yet created such a thing. Who knows? Maybe it will be one of you that gets to do that kind of research.